So I'm very happy to introduce to you, and they will speak more about their research through the next hour and a bit, hour and a half. So we have Gita Lubicic. Do I, did I say that correctly? Lubicic. Lubicic, yeah. sorry. Her maiden name was Laidler when I met her. <laughs> so she challenges me. Uh, Gita is with our Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering. Um, she is very much in love with the North and working with people in Nunavut, Labrador, Newfoundland. Uh, so I will uh, just say that Gita has, through the course of her uh, professional career in academia, she marries the concerns of the individuals with the environmental issues that she looks at, and so she brings that perspective to uh, our panel. Steve Cook, I remember when Steve joined Carleton. Steve, Steve is a fish biologist. There is a technical term for that. He's going to talk about that. But again, Steve, uh, Steve is, the interesting thing about Steve is, well, first of all, he is involved in so many things. Um, the research that Steve, that I first became aware of that Steve was doing in my uh, uh, pre-award work, which is working in the research office, is that Steve, a lot of what he does is around, do, do fish feel pain? So it, that's really interesting, isn't it? But he's also unique in that he's one of the few natural science and engineering people, <coughs> natural science people, who's involved in a shirt partnership grant. Um, and so not only does he think about the fish themselves and their movements and habitats and all that kind of thing, but also in <coughs> terms of their interactions that people have with fish and vice versa, and also around conservation uh, and, and good policy development. Gordon Duvall. Uh, so Gordon and I met a number of years ago. We don't see each other on a regular basis, but we were very thankful that he joined us uh, for this week. Uh, Gordon is, uh, we met, as I did actually, with Geneviève. Uh, we met when there was an organization here in Canada, NCARE, the Nat uh, National Council on the Ethics of Humans and Research, NCEHR. It doesn't exist anymore, but we have developed relationships that are now 15 years old. Uh, Gordon is, as you have heard, um, an academic person as well as being a practitioner, a lawyer, a biomedicine, and also is the chair of the Research Ethics Board at the National Research Council here. Rodney Nelson, also a wonderful colleague here at Carleton University. He's very much involved in the recruitment and retention of Aboriginal youth to post-secondary education here at Carleton. He is also a teacher, a professor in our sociology and anthropology department. Uh, his specialty, if I am correct, is on indigenous governance and economic development. Anyone know that one? Okay, thank you. And uh, we're very pleased to have him on this panel. Rodney has been to Hawaii and back to the west coast of Canada and back. And he is here, not quite sure what time zone he's in, but, but uh, you know he has lots to offer us today. And Patricia McGuire. So now you know Patricia is sort of related to me too, since I'm married to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia joined us last year in the School of Social Work. So I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to launch their talking by asking them if they would just take a few moments each, uh, we'll start with Gita and work this way, I guess, to talk about what their research is so that you will have a better perspective on that and how it is that it involves or, or uh, affects Indigenous peoples. I'm from Ottawa. I lived here all my life. Um, I never really enjoyed the cold. <laughs> I was a big complainer about cold. Never spend a whole lot of time outside, um, although my parents tried very hard to get me into it. Um, but I just, I highlight this because I've always been interested in learning different perspectives of the world, and I've always been interested in learning from Indigenous ways of knowing and, and, and being. Um, but hadn't had much exposure through growing up here. I got really interested in it at York University through my undergraduate degree in environmental studies. And um, there was a wonderful um, instructor there, Deborah McGregor. She's, uh, she's an Anishinaabe scholar, and she had, um, she since you know, went to U of T for work, and she's actually now back at York University as a professor there. Um, but she really kind of helped start this journey for me, and I was interested in environmental issues and learning from indigenous um, 
approaches and, and perspectives. So I wanted to keep learning, so I wanted to keep going in school. So I went to Queen's to do my master's, and there um, it, was, it was much more a science-focused project. It was learning about, um, learning, uh, about connections between uh, on the land, but also how you could learn from remote sensing perspective. So it was, it was kind of geography, environmental studies, geomatics, all kind of together. But at the time, my supervisor gave me three options. He said, uh, it was all on vegetation research, but he said, you can, have, you can work on a project I have in Quebec, or in Ontario, or in Nunavut. And I thought I would probably never otherwise go to Nunavut, and I would probably never go back. So it would be a wonderful adventure and learning, um, and a very big personal challenge, and kind of a once in a lifetime thing. Um, so for that project, uh, we spent two months on the tundra. So there were three students. We got flown in in a small plane, dropped off on a riverbed runway in the middle of the tundra on Boothia Peninsula, which is very the northernmost mainland of Canada, kind of central Nunavut. Um, dropped off, plane flew away. We spent two months there. So I had never been camping outside of a campground before. <laughs> I'd never been to the Arctic. You know, really did not know this context, but it was it was a wonderful adventure. At, you know, in that moment. Um, and I did not know how it would go for me. I would either really love it or I would be really challenged and probably not go back. Um, but so it was two months living on the land in that sense. And that was the first exposure for me. And it was, it, I, I, I guess, built my own connection in a way with the land. It was, it was just a completely life-changing experience. We were there to learn about plants. Um, but really, I was learning about myself the most through that time where you have no communication with any family for the two months and you're really in this remote location and it's just, it, it was so life-changing for me in an, in an inner way. I also learned a lot about tundra plants. Um, but in that time, it made me realize I wanted to learn more. I wanted to come back to the Arctic, but I wanted to learn more from people. So I didn't want to just be there doing the science side of things. I really wanted to learn more from people because Inuit had been living in those lands for, for generations and generations. And, and those were um, Boothia Peninsula is just north of current day Talukjuak, the community. And so um, Inuit have been using that area for generations. So, so I wanted to keep learning and, and continuing in school was one way to do that. Um, but shifting focus towards more the, the social and cultural approaches to research, continuing on in geography, um, which really emphasizes connections between people and the environment and understanding those relationships. But wanting to learn more from people, kind of switching from the terrestrial environment, the plants, to learning more about the marine environment. Um, so sea ice, which was through much consultation identified as a priority from the national level down to community level. Um, so that was kind of the, the foundation for my PhD research was to work with and learn from elders and hunters in Pangatung, Igloolik, and Cape Dorset, which are all around uh, Baffin Island in Nunavut. Um, and that has then kind of evolved into a journey and, and a long-term commitment for me to learn from and, and contribute however I can to the communities that we work with and also to addressing um, locally identified priorities. So the sea ice was certainly a priority and, and it was really a focus on um, Inuktitut terminology, like understanding the fundamental perspectives and, and concepts around sea ice. Um, but the importance of that in the past and today, the, the connections of sea ice to all aspects of life, in, even in current day communities, it, it's very much used um, as, a, as a platform for hunting and harvesting, as a connection between communities. It is the highway for most of the year, um, connecting people as well. So, so all that to say that, um, that kind of my ongoing focus in learning from Inuit and learning from indigenous knowledge more generally is to really try to understand these kind of complex socio-ecological connections from Inuit ways of knowing um, and to work specifically around priorities identified by the community partners that we work with. So most recently in Joe Haven, 
through a development grant that I had been talking about uh, a few days ago, we were able to do planning meetings just to simply identify what would be the research priorities in the community, how, how would the community advisors want to move forward with that, what kinds of methods would they want to use, and how would we work together on that through all phases of the project. So it's really, um, we, we focus on various kinds of environmental issues and priorities as identified by the community. But part of my research is also very much the process. So how do we work effectively together in a cross-cultural context? How do we ensure mutual understanding and meaning and, and mutual benefits to that? Somewhere along the, the lines, I ended up in, uh, at UBC for a postdoc. And it was at that time that I really started to interact a lot with, uh, with indigenous peoples. Studying Pacific salmon, it's sort of a given. There's inherent connections between, uh, between uh, salmon and indigenous communities in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, in many cases, that's sort of held up as you know, a sort of a, uh, um, you know, uh, flagship in in many ways, um, the we interact with indigenous peoples in a variety of different ways. So first of all, uh, to access fish, we need to access waters and lands that uh, that are uh, traditional uh, traditionally uh, territories or. Uh, of the indigenous communities that we we work with, and so part of it is is for uh, gaining access to resources. It's also gaining access to uh, the knowledge that they have. So helping us to understand uh, if we're asking a specific question, when we need to be there, how do we catch the specific animals? What time uh, are they migrating earlier this year than than normal? What condition are the fish in relative to what they they used to be in, and, and so on. Uh, and then also uh, in many cases we're working hand in hand with the research. And so uh, ideally that starts at the co-creation phase. So this idea of generating uh, research priorities and questions together, applying for grants together. Uh, and then uh, uh, in many cases as, a, uh, as an academic, I'm able to go after NSERC funding and then uh, for Virtually all the work that we do in British Columbia, we write into those grants funds to hire uh, indigenous peoples to work alongside us. So uh, there's a lot of variation among the communities that we work with. Many of them have uh, good fisheries technical staff uh, that are there, uh, people that have gone to uh, college. Uh, there are a lot of colleges in British Columbia that, uh, that provide sort of the Western science training. And then uh, a lot of the fishers have also worked uh, um, uh, uh, fisheries technicians have worked as fishers themselves, either as part of uh, traditional ceremonial fisheries, food fisheries, or uh, local economic opportunity fisheries, which are small-scale commercial fisheries uh, operated within those communities. So they're bringing both their uh, their traditional knowledge and experience, as well as uh, uh, the more traditional Western education that they've gotten um, uh, along the way. And so, uh, so we're able to hire uh, hire those individuals, and they work hand in hand with our students and contribute. To to the training of our students. We, of course, can assist with capacity building in some communities as, as well. Um, in addition to the work that we do in British Columbia, uh, we also do work in other parts of the world. Uh, we've done work in Brazil, uh, working with indigenous peoples that are affected by dam developments. Um, uh, Brazil, uh, the, the Amazon basin, uh, is being peppered with, uh, with dams. Uh, there are communities there that have been uh, uh, historically uh, very isolated, and essentially there's huge frontier uh, cities that are being built, cities that are uh, in the neighborhood of a million people that are popping up in the middle of the Amazon basin, and that's obviously changing their way of, of lives. The, uh, when dams are put in, the water courses are changed, uh, communities are displaced and move inland. So we've done some social science surveys there. And so I just brought up this idea of doing social science surveys, and I told you earlier I studied wild fish in the wild. Um, what I didn't tell you is my undergrad was in environmental studies before I really dove in and focused on, on the fish biology and the fish physiology. And the further along I, I've gone in my career, despite being in a biology department, I find myself coming back more and more to that, uh, to that undergrad training in environmental studies, focused more on the, the policy realm, social science, the human dimensions. Uh, one of the things I've come to realize is that fish aren't the problem, it's people. Uh, and so uh, it's about human behavior, understanding human behavior, uh, and by doing so, uh, what can we do to change the behavior and, and uh, obtain outcomes that are more uh, uh, beneficial to 
fish and natural resources and so on. And so now I'll, I'll take you back to British Columbia where uh, we have students that are working on, uh, on questions. We do biology. We do a lot of radio telemetry work in our lab where we'll put transmitters in or on fish and track them to spawning grounds and look at you know, how many make it, how many die, uh, how many are inter uh, intercepted by fisheries and, and so on. And so uh, doing something like that brings up interesting questions. So uh, some of the uh, uh, indigenous peoples that we work with say, whoa, you're, you know, I I'm not sure I feel comfortable with you putting electronic tags in those fish and you're using, uh, you're using drugs to sedate the fish to do the various processes. You know? And then we'll be working uh, alongside uh, alongside them and we'll see a recreational fishing boat drift by and they'll they'll have remarks about oh I don't understand why they're playing with fit playing with the fish that's food source why are they playing with those animals for pleasure as opposed to focusing on harvesting them for for food and so that's brought up a lot of interesting uh, questions uh, I'll remind you that the lower Fraser has three active fisheries there's the indigenous fisheries there's the recreational sector and then there's the commercial sector and then the indigenous sector is broken up into, again, the ceremonial fisheries and then small-scale commercial. And so there's tr uh, traditionally been uh, a lot of conflict with, within, that, uh, within that group. Um, and uh, that provides opportunity for us as, uh, as scientists to try and understand the basis of, those, uh, of that conflict uh, and understand their, um, their perceptions about the research that we're doing, uh, threat perceptions uh, to the resource. And in many cases, we focus on trying, uh, trying to identify barriers. What are the barriers to, uh, to action? What are the barriers of uptake to the knowledge that we're, uh, that we're generating? And so um, I think uh, even though I'm, I guess, a, a biologist at, at heart, uh, I'm spending more and more time uh, in the, uh, again, playing in that uh, human dimension realm. And we're learning an awful lot by, by doing so. I'm probably coming at this from a different perspective. I'm coming at it from the perspective of being um, Anishinaabek um, Washakade, meaning that I'm um, Ojibwe Métis from uh, Northwestern Ontario and um, why I went to school. And um, so I graduated from Lake University with a BA in political science because I wasn't sure if I wanted to go into law or if I wanted to go into community development. The reason why I had gone to school was because I had seen the, the community I'm from is about 250 people and it's on Lake Nipping and it was called McDermott. It was, uh, half of it was uh, um, the, um, became an Indian reserve. It was called uh, Rocky Bay. And then on the other side was the Métis settlement. And that's where we lived because uh, we weren't considered to be status Indians because my mother had married my father. My grandma, grandmother had married my grandfather who was Irish and so, so we were, um, weren't allowed to live on the, the reserve site. And um, which was, in my view, was good because the, um, if you owned your own house at that time, you, um, you could tell people not to come into your house or go, you can kick them off your land. And so when, and, uh, when child welfare came by to apprehend children, we, weren't, we were one of the few families that weren't apprehended. So it was actually really um, a good thing not to be part of the Indian Act. The, but when I was being raised in that small community, I kept seeing the same um, hill every year. They would, it would be brush cut. And so, and then I asked my dad, I said, well, how can they do that every year? Like, you know, it's what, and, and these were choice jobs too for, for young people. And, um, and he says, oh, consultant, a consultant wrote a, um, a report. And so this is economic development. And, um, and I was thinking in my head, I said, okay, I want one of those jobs, but I don't want to be the one cutting the brush. I want to be the one that's writing those proposals. And um, my family and I, um, I was out on the, um, the land with my family until I was 15. And the last time that I was on the land with my family, as my whole family, was when I was in my early 20s. And so um, about four, four, about three to four months of the year, we only came off the land when the police came and told us that we had to go to school. And so, the, um, and I treasure those moments with my family. Because uh, now, when I look at other people that haven't had those experiences, I realize how, um, what a privilege it was and what a responsibility as well. Because when I was listening to um, Marcel, Marcel the Chimakawensi, talking this morning about the canoe, I recognized a lot of the teachings that came from the land. And also the, um, 
I also recognize the responsibility that's given to people that have those knowledges of how to live on the land. And so um, when I look at the research that I do, I did my, my MA on, um, in sociology and I did my PhD in sociology. And um, what I did is I looked at Indigenous knowledge and how did Indigenous knowledge um, is um, both a form of resilience but also a way to do development because um, our knowledges were um, externalized or decontextualized from our communities and so through residential school and there was uh, blockages so that if uh, people, if children were taken away to residential school and then those knowledges that people had they couldn't transfer them to their children or their grandchildren. And when the kids came back from residential school, not all of them, but a large majority of um, people came back from residential school, they, they couldn't speak the language anymore. And so there was a, there was a direct disruption in the transfer of knowledge from the, the knowledge keepers to the people that, um, that would have retained the knowledge. And so what I'm interested in is I look at those ruptures that happen, and I don't focus on those ruptures, but I look at the, the knowledges that we still have in our community and how the people that have had the advantages that need to transfer those knowledges to other people. So the research proposal that I'm looking at right now is um, I'm looking at women that have had involvement with the child welfare system, and I'm looking at how land-based interventions can help them to remember a time where they weren't traumatized. And, um, and I think that some of the research that I'm, I'm looking at is, as far as um, people that have been writing about what, uh, what happens to your body when you're on the land and what happens to your brain is um, when you're on the land for at least three days, your, your blood pressure goes down. Your, your brain, your, you start dreaming more. You start, and if you get rid of all the electronic devices, um, I remember when I was teaching at a college and um, they asked me to teach a land-based course for, for tourism. And so I took, um, and I, I still can't believe I did it, but I took like 38 students um, that had never been on the, land, on the land in the middle of February in Thunder Bay on uh, Lake Superior. And uh, everybody came back with their tools <laughs> and their fingers. <laughs> Nobody got frostbite. <laughs> but one of the things that I noticed is that when we were there is... Um, is that the students, the first thing they did is they put on all their electronic devices. Like, you know, they had batteries and I said, okay, first rule is get rid of those things right now. If you want to leave, you can leave. If you have to check your phone every five minutes, you can leave. Um, otherwise, if you want to stay and learn, you can turn all those devices off. And, um, and they were like shocked and some of them were like kind of testing me. And I said, I told you guys, if you don't have to be here, this isn't uh, mandatory for you, but if you want to learn, I want you to stay, but you have to turn the phones off, you have to turn the iPods off, you have to turn off the computers, you have to turn off everything. And, um, and nobody left and so they did that. And so, and then when I was doing a, a lesson plan with them after they turned everything off, I realized the majority of them were falling asleep. And, and, there was, and then all of a sudden, like I'm teaching and, and I'm looking and I'm thinking everybody's falling asleep. So I told everybody, I said, okay, but we're not gonna do this right now. I think you guys need like 15, 20 minute nap. And they did, they, 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 they went to sleep and um, for, the, for the whole three days we were out there, the students didn't turn it on. And so, and then we made fires, we went snowshoeing, we looked at the bush, we, we, we were on the land. And, um, and the students that were amazed that they could function with all, all the devices, they also said, one of the things they said is that, I've never slept like that for a long time. And I realized that all the, the stuff that they were doing actually doesn't give their brain a break. Because if you're constantly stimulated, then your brain really doesn't have a break. And so that's one of the, the, the reasons why I look at um, what, what you can do on the land over a year period. And, uh, and how, what it does to your body, but also what it does to your brain, because I was really concerned when I was reading, um, it was a young, it's an, uh, she's an academic, she's um, um, Anishinaabek from Treaty 3, Pompeii is her last name, and she's uh, at McGill University, and, and um, elders had always talked about blood memory. Like when I started, um, I do birch bark biting, and so when I started doing birch bark biting, it was like, um, my, I couldn't believe it. It was just like, it was so easy. Eh? And so I was making like all these different kinds of trees. I was like doing like butterflies and bees and, and everybody else, like when I would tell them, they were saying, well, I did this, 
this the, this one this one design, and I was like, oh, because I was kind of shy to show them, right? And so when they seen me, I was like, who taught you how to do that? And I said, I don't know. I just decided that I wanted to do that one day. And so when I phoned the Maria Linkletter, who's uh, who's uh, her and her husband have taken the opportunity to teach me, and. Um, and I really I have a lot of respect for them. And the Marie sa said, your blood memory is coming back. And I didn't know what she meant when she said that. But what Amy Pompey does is that she looks at blood memory, but she's a geneticist. And so she looks at that how, and her research concerns how trauma is transmitted through, um, through the mother. But, and so she's looking at blood memory too. But she, the, and so that, the, and so there's studies that say that, that trauma is, um, it changes your DNA, but it also changes your brain chemistry in like simple terms because I don't know the complicated ones of genetic research. <laughs> so that's what I understand about it. And, and so I was, really, um, I was really upset when I heard that because I thought, like, what kind of interventions do you design them? Like, how can you help people heal? Like, how can you, you know, what do you do to help communities? Like, what do you, how do you teach people? And then I realized the, the, the land is there. And so you have to get people back on the land. And once I realized that, I realized that when people are on the land, the, the trauma that occurred in the last 140 years, or like since 17 or 1876, or whenever the last, the, the last major consolidation of the Indian Act, is that that's when things started to change in my area anyway. That's what the elders remember is that up until that point, people uh, lived together quite well without government interference. But when the, the Indian Act was consolidated and children were forcibly removed from their homes and forced into residential school, that's when changes happen. So, I, so when I look back at that time, I realize there's thousands of years that Indigenous people have been on this land, and we just have to tap into that memory. We have to tap into that blood memory. So that's where, where I thought the best thing to do is to take, especially women, and um, when um, I usually start off, like when I speak, I also have like PowerPoint and I always bring up a picture of three of my grandmothers that we've, um, my father gave me this picture and uh, it's my grandmother, um, Agnes Nagola, and then um, the picture Gustik was in the middle and she's my, my great, great grandmother. And then, um, then my great grandmother's Kajishab and, and my dad always talked about how the, the signing of the treaty when Kajish was there, but also uh, Pikagusikwa, how she outfitted her daughter and taught her daughter how to to go from um, Heron Bay down, down the river onto Lake Superior and up to Lake Nebuchadnezzar when she was 14, and how they made a canoe, and uh, and how that old lady and her granddaughter made this canoe. And um, so, so for me, that's a reminder that I have to talk about women, because my father always said, never forget your grandmothers. But also, it's a reminder that, that we have to start looking at how we heal on the land. And that's, so that's part of my research. Thank you. Um, so, Bojo Koi Koi Rodney Nelson and Dishnakas, Nipissing and Makwa Dodam. I'm Rodney Nelson from Nipissing First Nation. And um, I'm from the Bear Clan, but I also have ancestry that goes back to the Lakotas down in Rosebud First Nation down in South Dakota. And during the Indian Wars in the States, one of my ancestors came up um, after uh, the, the massacre at Wounded Knee and came up through into the prairies and of course was called horse thieves and sent back. But uh, what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of the Sioux spread all throughout Canada as well. And one man made it all the way across to uh, into uh, Nipissing, uh, up near North Bay, and married into the Nipissing group. So that's part of my heritage. And I have uh, a long, or was I just discovering royalty side and the English side. So my great, great, great grandfather was the Lord Snowden, apparently. Who knew? And then, uh, <laughs> and then I have some Dutch heritage. So I always say that's where I got the big head from. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm a mixed bag, I guess. A Heinz 57, um, interesting mix. Uh, I've always grown up in and out of the bush. My father was always dragging us into the bush, uh, kicking and screaming sometimes because, uh, you know, I, I I would I would love to go, but the mosquitoes were always bad, and I was allergic to mosquitoes. 
So it was a hard life for me growing up being allergic for mosquitoes and having to go into the bush every weekend or other weekend as we did. Uh, he was a military man, so we moved around a lot. I was born in Siska uh, territory out in the west um, and uh, always had part of my heart there as well as all over the place. I uh, spent some time, um, some horrible time in a day school where I was beaten daily. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget the day that my father came in and, and rescued me, I call it. He came in with his full military uniform because I had finally told him after months of this. I was sent down every day and, uh, and, and beaten with either a two by four or by a, a, a giant board. Uh, for shooting spitballs, I was a bad kid and sometimes I was shooting spitballs, so I joke about it, at least humor to get over that kind of thing. But he came in and, and told him, and said, you touch my son again and I will kill you. And that was it, the last time they laid a hand on me. And then I was out of that, out of that school, which was nice. Um, so education and me, we didn't get along very well for the longest time. Uh, but here I am in the Institute now, fully immersed, loving it, enjoying it, and uh, doing a lot of interesting work with communities. Everything I do has to do with community. So if I'm not helping community, if I'm not helping our communities or people alleviating poverty, helping reduce suicide rates in our community, helping on governance, helping chief and council, um, board of directors set up for economic development corporations, these are all things that I'm interested in doing. Uh, which I guess is my research area. Uh, I'm also involved in um, emergency management planning, pandemic planning and whatnot as well. It's kind of on the ethical side, uh, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, I think probably one of my most interesting things I've done was uh, I was the ethics officer for Public Works after Gomery. So if you remember the sponsorship scandal, they, uh, they appointed me in to be the ethics officer to clean up everything. So. I don't think they realize that they uh, ask an Anishinaabe person to come in and clean up ethics in the public service, but hey, it was an interesting post for me. I'm very <coughs> interested uh, these days. I just came back from, from BC and uh, being, you know, at least, I won't say that I certainly wasn't living on the land because I had a Mustang convertible as I was driving through the land, which was quite nice. Um, but it's it's always an experience. You, you know, Patricia was right, you, you get this immediate good feeling about being out and enjoying that 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 connection and as I was going to there's several communities we just met with um, well I just met with which was eight communities out in Okanagan Valley and we're talking about health care and access to health care and you know they're they're struggling uh, they're struggling a lot with just finding any kind of medical care within their communities and I was nervous going in as I usually am at the beginning and I was going along and uh, and, and I thought, well, I'm not even prepared for this. You know, I, I, I have to go in and facilitate this discussion and pull out for them and help them out and, and talk about some of what I've done and how we can incorporate that into, into their accessing healthcare. And I was really nervous. And then I, I was driving down with my top down in, my, in the Mustang, which is really, I shouldn't, I don't know why I'm telling you I was in a Mustang, but it was a cool car. I'd never driven a Mustang before. <laughs> And I looked up and there's these beautiful hills passing me and I was feeling very, very nervous. And then I saw this beautiful bald eagle just floating in the sky and coming down and landing on, the, uh, on, a, on top of a treetop. And you know, I looked up and saw the beautiful white tail feathers and the white head and just the spread and the river was running through that. And I thought, you know, I take it as a sign as, as basically saying, you know, this is a, I'm on a good path today will go well, things will be good. And I immediately just started to relax. And for me, <clears throat> looking back at our traditional stories, our traditional ways, our traditional values, I'm always looking for a way to incorporate them into today. So into our research, into how we live daily, how we look at all of our research, even as an academic, but as a community member, um, how we can bring these together and will they work together? And I think absolutely there's so much similarities um, and major differences as well. But it's a beautiful thing when they finally come together and you see that a lot of these traditional teachings can guide the way that people are doing business today. Uh, leaders in their communities, um, social workers working with, uh, with, uh, with, their, with their community members. Uh, so that's my real interest is in, 
is in looking at our traditional stories and our traditional ways and how we can incorporate that into research. And I uh, thank you for being here and uh, I've been, I know I'm a little tired and I didn't even acknowledge, I wanted to acknowledge the elders in the room. Um, I went around to see everybody except for Cleos. I hadn't had time to say hello to you, grandfather, but hello, good to see you again. So, miigwech. I, as I said, I don't do um, Aboriginal research. I, um, maybe I'm not sure why I'm here, but I, uh, I'm trying to uh, maybe represent the perspective of research ethics boards and the kinds of things that they are maybe looking for or worried about or curious about uh, from that. But I will say, and, and I also, I, I won't speak too long because I'm um, uh, trying to remember that the creator gave me two ears but only one mouth for a, for a reason. Um, but I do, um, the res some of the research I do do, I do has been in uh, international research, primarily health research in sub-Saharan Africa. So, and, and I'm just sort of finishing up a project now uh, about um, prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV in um, some of the poorer countries of, of sub-Saharan Africa. And, I, and the thing that has struck me, and, and, Susan, and the TCPS uh, mentions this, and Susan Zimmerman talked about this yesterday, but the uh, in, in dealing with or trying to come up with uh, research and undertaking the research in a community that is, has a somewhat different worldview, somewhat different uh, sort of cultural understandings and so forth, um, that the, uh, I was really struck by some connections between the need for community engagement, the need for consultation, understanding, um, as we think about in terms of indigenous people's research, uh, and also uh, thinking about the need for fair benefits of the of the research process and the doing of the research, um, community to community, perhaps. And so, certainly, those are issues that I think about, and I think have perhaps some connections when when we think about the uh, Aboriginal communities. Um, uh, these international uh, communities in quite different cultures. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm uh, looking forward to the rest of our discussion. You, you have questions, and we, we have been trying to address questions around incorporating indigenous knowledge into your work. Presenting that in a protocol to a research ethics board, trying to think about ownership and possession and access to information and also dissemination. So I, I put it to you and some of the thoughts that you might be having if you would like to ask questions of our panelists. Well, I will start. <laughs> So I'd like, if you would, please, to maybe talk. Let's take it to the end of the research and maybe work our way backwards to talk about how it is or some of the approaches and strategies that you have for making sure that not only do you disseminate to your colleagues in scholarship, but also to the communities. <coughs> maybe I could, you know, and just I'm not going to point to you. Just jump in, because this is meant to be more of a conversation now. Yeah, we do a workshop once a year at UBC where we bring in all the folks that, that we partner with. And so that's uh, federal government, provincial government, and ENGOs, indigenous uh, community members. Uh, and in that forum, there were 71 people at our meeting this, this past year. So this is not a, not a small group. Uh, and that's, uh, it's, it's two way. It's not just us saying what we did. It's also where we then have an opportunity to get feedback on where we're going in, in the future. Uh, and so we find that useful, but we also use students quite a bit. I mean, I'm uh, uh, an academic, and that means I'm also an educator, and so I can't be the only face of our group. I need to provide an opportunity for our students to do so, and so our students are the ones that are going out and doing the majority of the interactions, especially on the back end, uh, in terms of sharing information, sharing, sharing results. That works quite well. Not quite as well on the front end, but on the back end, uh, the students are really the face of our group. It's not the PIs going out. Uh, so that's how we get the 
you know, uh, offering, uh, you know, to come and, and speak with, with groups. It might be a group. Oftentimes the fisheries groups come together. So in the lower Fraser River, there's the lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance. So we don't have to go to 20 or 30 different bands. They're all members of these uh, umbrella organizations. And so uh, we can go there and then people hear about it and we get other invites from there. But we, we very much empower the students to go out and, and be our voice. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have a a challenge is that I like, you know, as an academic, you have to disseminate knowledge and your research to academics and to publish in top tier research journals and whatnot and things like that. Um, but I've always wanted to reach again, like I said, I work with community. So I want to publish in, if I'm publishing or if I'm disseminating information, I want it to be in journals or not journals even, but um, access that the community can use, they can look at, they can understand. I mean, it's really hard to go to a community and say, oh, we're going to talk about Foucault and everything like that. When they look at you like, you're nuts, right? So, you know, a very, uh, I, I don't know if it's a nervousness I have or, or this fear of publishing in these journals or if I just don't think it will give the access that I want to see happen at the community level. So there's still this definite dichotomy of of two different types of publishing. But as an academic, you have to do that. But as a community member, you'd rather do more things like community reports and be with the community, working with the community, or, or publishing through people, if I'm going to publish, like can do, you know, which is the development officers or, or AFOA or other groups in which makes an impact because it's being read by community members. So there's that interesting thing is you almost have to write two articles, right? Mm -hmm. One to disseminate to the academic world and one to to put out into the community world. So I still struggle with that today. I, I really want to emphasize, um, you know, in any of the early planning discussions we've had with any of the communities we work with, the concern comes up over and over and over about kind of the historical legacy of poor communication, poor reporting to communities and to individuals that researchers had worked with in the past. I think that is changing and, and it's definitely improving. Um, but the elders would ask over and over, you know, what are we, how are we going to benefit? How is the community going to use this information? How will it be accessible? So, so one thing I, I've really prioritized since the earliest of those discussions um, was to not think about reporting or dissemination only at the end of a project. Like it's all the way through the entire relationship from the earliest stages to the end and beyond. So um, there's many ways to do that and we've tried many things. But, but one of the things that I, I really emphasize and I always try and do is do kind of reports. So any do kind of progress reports or we call them trip reports, but any visit that we have, any kind of formal meetings or workshops or discussions, even if it's preliminary planning ones, that we do short, really short reports with pictures and highlight who we worked with, what we did, why we were there, and, and kind of the next steps. So it kind of keeps that conversation going. And we heard many times as well, you know, if that even sometimes reports are given back at the end of a project. But if it's four years after the start of a project, it, it people forget about it. And it kind of seems like nothing was ever given back. Um, or if it's only reported um, to the community organizations, like at, a, at an organizational level, that's very important, but the individuals involved don't always hear from those organizations. So, so this kind of ongoing interim reporting, it, we do it in a written form and it's translated into local dialects. We also do it informally in many ways, just keeping in touch with people. Um, so that interim aspect I would really encourage as well as um, reporting to the formal organizations as well as every individual involved. So I sometimes do these mass mailings, like the post office knows me now, they see me coming and they're like, ah. Um, where I still do a lot of hard copy mailing because a lot of people don't have email. And so we print out all these reports and, and mail them to every individual involved. And sometimes it can be uh, a large pile of, of letters by the end. But it's just been one way that we've been trying and, and I have visited elders, you know, many years later through an ongoing project and they, 
they see me and they kind of open a drawer where not everyone does this, but some have kept like all the stack of letters that I've ever sent them. Um, and it's just neat to see. At least it's getting there and it's um, the translation is so important if that is appropriate in the community. And um, it's, it's just one way of doing it. But there are many other ways. I just really encourage you to think about kind of on dissemination is ongoing and it's a two way flow. Can I play off that a, a little bit more? Um, one of the things that we've done, the, the more successful partnerships that we have are when it's not thought of as projects, but a program. Mm -hmm. So projects, and, and, and of course that means you have to be doing something where you've got some funding stability. Thankfully, Pacific Salmon provide such stability. Um, they're sufficiently in the toilet that uh, there's opportunities for us to obtain uh, funding from a diversity of, uh, of funding pots. Uh, but a project usually has a you know a, a terminal date where it's over. It might be a grad student project. It might be a specific research project. But if you can frame it in the context of a program, where there's not it, it, it inherently makes it, um, it there's some longevity. It's not just coming in, going back out. Uh, and yes, we have students that do projects that are embedded within our program. But it's it's seamless. It's not it's not viewed that way by the communities that we're interacting with. I think that's really, really helpful. Uh, it's that continuity. The PIs are always there in the background and some of our, our research technicians, the students will come and go, uh, but we don't make a big deal of it. You know, Katrina's leaving, bye. We don't, you know, it's, it's that there's a transition as you know, one thing tra transitions into the other. And I think that brings um, uh, a sense of stability to the relationship uh, instead of it being stop, start, stop, start. Does anybody have a question? Yes, I, um, I'm not sure if it's a, uh, it's, I guess it's a question of how do you deal with the stuff you can't control. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, but, so here's, maybe I'll contextualize this, but um, well, I guess the question is uh, how do you deal with some of that information that you're producing afterwards? And so I guess to contextualize, here's an example. I was at a conference not too long ago, and they were talking about how um, you know, they were going and they were tracking um, you know, migration of, I can't remember what it was, they were tracking migration. And they were tagging, just like kind of what you were saying, they were tagging, uh, and they were trying to figure out where things were going. Um, and locals were kind of, um, uh, you know, skeptical, as you were talking about earlier in, in your approach, because uh, they've got, you know, hundreds of years of teachings that talk about migration patterns and so forth. And one of the problems was afterwards, uh, this information came back, uh, the scientific information came back, um, and, um, government started pointing to that as sort of a means of further colonization, right? To kind of say, okay, now we're going to start controlling, um, you know, hunting patterns. We're going to start controlling, you know, who can do what and, and how you sort of live off, off of the land in mm -hmm. certain ways. So I guess it's kind of the question is, how do you deal with the stuff afterwards that you can't control? Or, or this information is incredible information, but it's information that um, could easily be used in different ways, right? By, by someone else um, looking to further colonization, further Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's a fair question, but it's more, it's not, obviously not your responsibility, but how do you deal with that? Has it happened to you? How do you grapple with that, I guess? Um, sorry, big question. Sorry. Don't, first of all, don't apologize, because it is a very that's good a, question, yeah. and you're anticipating a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. the name of this panel, <laughs> and trying to find solutions. Right. And, and it, 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 I guess, if I could just maybe give you a moment to think about the answer to that. But it, but it does speak to the methodology, and it does speak to the interaction, and it sort of speaks to, well, not sort of, it does speak to the kinds of information that you're eliciting and what people are comfortable with giving to, to the researchers and the levels of their participation, right? And not just being seen as research subjects. Um, there, there will always be unscrupulous people, but it's, it's in your, it's in your relationship and your design. I, I would imagine, and if you want to, have I given you enough time to think about <laughs> that? Well, you certainly don't want to do harm. I mean, that's that's the, the ultimate goal. And you know, there's a res there's a heavy burden and responsibility on your research that afterwards. You know, you're you're looking at it and saying, "I hope this never gets used against a community." Um, I think one of the things, and, and you said, build it into the research. Is uh, all along the ways you're talking to elders and to leaders and whatnot, and you're saying, "You know, 
should this be shared? Should this be shared? Can this be used? You know, and even asking them to to a degree, have you, you know, is this is this data been used before against the community in a way, if you will? Um, but you, we also, as as the researcher, have to think about the harm it has that it that it could do as well later on. And I think that that's that's the burden, right? That's that's the hard thing to do, is that. You know, a community might not think that, you know, oh, this is fine. It can give you a caribou migration, and here you go. And then all of a sudden, the government uses your research to forbid hunting of caribou, and then you destroyed a protein source. They're right, they're right there, right? Um, so, you know, we also have to think about it in different ways too, as to how this research may be used against us. Um, I've seen. I, I I haven't had it happen to myself, uh, to tell you the truth. I mean, a lot of my work is. It doesn't involve a lot of that kind of harm, but uh, um, I think that, you know, I imagine if it did, I'd, I don't know what I would be doing back in there groveling, apologizing, and, and you know, uh, it, would be, it would be a really hard thing to do because it would really hurt and harm a relationship, and it is about a relationship, right? Um, so, yes, I think that, you know, building in it as much as you can as far as constantly thinking about how the data will be used if not making it anonymous you know uh, even changing that study up so that it wouldn't even necessarily affect uh, or even be identified to that community or that area kind of reminded me of what you're saying earlier about the publication of this stuff right like sometimes where do you publish this is this information you may want to just share with the community or is information that you do want to have it disseminated everywhere and publicly accessible maybe some you know depending on the situation maybe that's some of the conflict, I guess, the tensions and absolutely yeah. having to publish, 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 and talk to your journals, like you say, maybe sometimes that's not the best thing to do. It's that information. So. This seems like a really hard, hard problem because um, I'm speaking, perhaps from, unfortunately, from a biased standpoint of the more traditional sort of scientific or scholarly way, is I think that a, a lot of people. Um, have taken the view that, or have just sort of come up in a culture that knowledge is knowledge, right? Knowledge shouldn't belong to people. Knowledge is for everyone, for the whole world, and, and any, anybody who can use that knowledge um, should be able to have it because it's knowledge. And um, so, what, so it sounds like what we're talking about is, okay, then how is that knowledge? One, is it good knowledge? Has it been validly collected and methodologically rigorous and so forth? Is it true knowledge, valid knowledge, whatever, and I know those are sort of oversimplifying concepts, but in any event, um, how is that, you know, going to be used? And I think it, it, uh, it f sort of thinking about it from my more traditional research sort of way of thinking about it, when people sort of predict, okay, how is this going to be used? Is that going to be bad? Is that going to be good? Um, that starts to be sort of worrying in terms of the production of of true knowledge or valid knowledge or knowledge that is really real. And um, I, I mean, I, I get the point about how knowledge has been misused in the past, how it can be, uh, have, you know, racist uses or, or inappropriate uses or un insensitive uses and, and, uh, or wrong uses. Um, but I think that, I think that that, um, that sort of way of thinking that knowledge is, Important and people should have knowledge. You know, like I mean, we expand knowledge for everyone, right? Hopefully, that's a bit idealistic, but you know, that that's the idea, and it, and it seems to run into that, you know, into this other kind of problem. Yeah, I wondered about uh, like you're talking about data information that's written down. Um, that is the Western method. But there's also other forms of writing there, indigenous too, as you know, bridge for uh, mm -hmm. the Wasabak recording of uh, history and everything. But what's really um, making me aware of the differences is when I hear you talk about knowledge, it's like the noun, it's a thing. And for Anishinaabe concepts of knowledge, it's about doing. It's about being involved in it. Because we have a very verb-oriented language and way of thinking and doing things. And then the actual noun is formed out of a verb. And if we really trace back things to our linguistic sense of scholarship, 
what I really see um, is problematic as regards to copyright issues is we have copyright law in Canada, right? But we still, in Canada, we don't have an equivalent of protection of indigenous knowledge. There's indi indigenous traditional knowledge and then there's indigenous knowledge, which is contemporary research done by indigenous peoples. So I think that's one of the key problems. And I remember uh, last night hearing uh, Paul Chartrand talk about the issue of communication, and it, it comes back to that again, right? Because whether it's spoken, <coughs> or it's felt, experienced, or it's actually written down or recorded through technological means, it's still a way of communicating that information, right? Passing it on. So I'm wondering how any of you can think about well, the issue of copyright, especially um, uh, when you spoke about the differences between publishing uh, within the community, because you're an indigenous person, rather than in an academic journal, which has different you know, aesthetics. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Everybody's looking at me again. <laughs> um, I would add to that, I mean, and I, I, you said it so eloquently as well, is that we have traditional knowledge, but I would also add to that sacred knowledge. And sacred knowledge is that which I've always been told by elders is that that cannot be shared. It's for a specific person or a time or a place or, or whatever. And when we do get that sacred knowledge, we've got to be very careful, you know, especially then you step into the academic world. Can we take that knowledge and, you know, we start writing about it? Yeah, you can't do that, right? That's not that kind of knowledge to be shared. But then there's traditional, and then I was told traditional knowledge is that for everyone. Traditional knowledge is just a good way of being, right? It's bimo dazuin. It's it's that good good life, a good way, and a good heart, and it, it's it's knowledge that can be shared with anyone at any time. Um, so I, that's one. I'm I'm always walking that strange path between sacred and traditional knowledge, and how much you can't share that, but you can share this, and 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 figuring that out. But that's why we have the elders that are able to help us out with that and, and, and community members that, you know, when they specifically tell you, you know, this is sacred knowledge, do not share this. Or, and, and sometimes you get it word for word. You know, I love when people say knowledge changes also and stories change over time. Yes, absolutely. But there's sacred knowledge that has been shared word for word, generation after generation after generation after generation, that you are not allowed to change one word of it, right? But yeah, to, you know, and, and I agree with you, is that you know, this, we have to perpetuate knowledge con con constantly, and it is a lot of knowledge is for, for sharing for everyone. You know, and let's say psychology, you, know, you don't use a person's name, you don't use, and, and for a lot of people looking at a, a body of work that you're doing, they're not gonna be able to decipher that community members will be able to decipher who you're talking about instantaneously but then you know out there most people wouldn't be able to talk about it so I've seen that before which is interesting would you also say because you, you know you you make me think about not just the issue of dissemination or copyright but also in terms of informed consent you know to, to be dealing with all aspects of your research and not just that part that involves the human participants or the <coughs> secondary use of data, you know, using data that's already out there, but in terms of how you envisioned your program of research, where that project fits into <coughs> it, but the longer term and, and more extended viewpoint of what you do in knowledge creation and knowledge sharing. So in terms of informed consent, I think is perhaps one way that uh, this knowledge that's shared with researchers and, and in, the, in terms of the, the research that's being done is one way to help manage it because people understand better in informed consent uh, what it is that you're, you're doing together. Would, th would that be a fair statement? Another way that we can do it is just by verbally. And yes. like I will write, this is, I, you know, I. I said, I'm not sourcing this. I've, I've written that directly into even my PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. This section is not going to be sourced, period. Deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just, and then I just talk from where the elder had come from. And I did not get elders to sign off on a piece of paper. I said, <laughs> it's, it's, I asked permission, it was given, and that's good enough, right? And so I, I kind of had, 
probably shouldn't say this out loud yet until it's like just, you know, it's kind of, the acad academics are going to have to change a little bit to the way that knowledge is given and understood and um, permission given as well, so. Yeah, I find that too with elders, like just dealing with paper, it's just re-traumatizing yeah. when we think of treaties and signing over medical information and, and those kinds of things, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, for this is going to be a problem because a lot of elders are just are going to refuse to have even their voice recorded as you know substitute for signing a form. So the research ethics board is going to have to deal with that. That's never right? done. And and I think they are. I think they're starting to look at that and saying, you know, we understand that this collection of knowledge is is coming from a different place in which. It's not appropriate to get, you know, a written consent form to say that. But we still ask permission, right? We always still ask permission for an elder. So it's it's good. I know Patricia. An interesting part of that, and I'm wondering how many historians there are in, in this room, is uh, what will be what will constitute knowledge. And it seems that this group is, is on side. But I'll use it an example from Newfoundland, where all academics interpreted the only really living documents that existed by a guy named Speck uh, in a certain way. And, and this was commonly accepted, but the optics, but the Mi'kmaq and that type of thing. And then a fellow named Wetzel, uh, a Mi'kmaq from Con River, took Speck's information and realized that no direct communication, no oral knowledge had been allowed to be included. It was only Speck's interpretation. And he reinterpreted the whole history of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq and caused a complete revolution. And academics are still fighting. There's a woman named uh, Ingeborg Marshall who really adopted the idea, oh yeah, that the Mi'kmaq and the French helped wipe the Beothic so it wasn't really the Newfoundland. And, and yet Speck's notes from the oral, uh, oral uh, data that he had really disallowed that. So now there's a whole new history. But many historians still to this day tell me that it's not acceptable if it's not written down. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it doesn't sound to me like people are, have to deal with that here, but here in our university it's still going on. So what would even be considered as the knowledge? Do you have to deal with any part of that or is it just all okay in this gathering? I want to jump in, but I'm not sure where to start. <laughs> Those are all really good questions. Um, from from my experience in in a few Nunavut communities, I, I doesn't certainly speak for for speak for any of them, and it's only from a few. But um, is that the elders and the hunters that we have spoken with and learned from, and that were so generous with sharing their knowledge? They want their names included, and they want to be. They, they want others to know that it was them sharing that and contributing that information. So we do work it into our, we do have consent forms, although we have been changing things a lot over time, but um, where there's options of if you want your name used or not, as well as options around um, how the information, like where it would be stored, who would have access, and how that may be able to be used in the future, and who gives those permissions. There's kind of various options from only in the community to um, all the way to, you know, broadly for any educational purpose to not at all. Like there's a whole range of things. Um, um, one way that we've tried to deal with the, the credit issue it doesn't really deal with the copyright side of things, but to really make sure that whenever we're sharing the results, it's very clear that it's not it's not us like it's it's not coming from us. We we as as outside researchers that we've been learning from many many different community members, and so um, crediting that all the way through reports or articles, whether it's an academic or a piece <coughs> saying. Um, kind of like a citation like you would with a journal article, but saying it's from this interview and, and naming the person if they wanted to be named or not if they didn't want to be named, um, as well as using a lot of, of quotes 
um, so that it's the, it's the best way within the written form that we can communicate some of that oral knowledge. Um, it, it's all been shared orally. Um, and so trying to really, really carefully follow, you know, who was contributing what and try to really make that credit very clear that um, these understandings are coming from these contributors or these mentors, um, as well as considering authorship in those reports or those articles. Um, some people have done, you know, include a whole community as an author. And I personally just find that really challenging because there's no way that you could you could ever ensure that the entire community, you know, reviewed and, and contributed to that paper. Um, but what, so what we've done is, is there's always kind of one or two really key mentors, advisors, um, coordinators, and researchers. Uh, they, they play those many roles um, within a project or, yeah, it's not only project-based, but... Um, continuous work that there's been kind of one or two key people that facilitate all the work locally and so those would be the authors and that any other contributors throughout the process would be cited or acknowledged all the way through not just in an acknowledgement section where you just name everybody but really all the way through wherever they've contributed so that is just one idea I want to put out there I know it doesn't quite deal with the copyright side of things um, um, but and also on the the issue of sensitive topics, I would say a lot of discussion about that um, up front, but all the way through and and working together to discuss and analyze and interpret and verify any of the understandings coming out of this collective work is so important before starting to share it publicly. Um, and I think some of the, Scott Nichols earlier this week mentioned the, the idea of like open data policies and that everything is going to be required to be shared and, and Shirk is coming with those policies as well. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good in that, but there's also, you know, it needs to be really sensitive and not everything can be openly shared and that needs to be discussed with the community and what would be sensitive that they would not want shared. Um, and we do a lot of participatory mapping work, which can be especially sensitive at times if you're identifying like really important migration routes or cultural sites or hunting areas or you know, really sensitive um, potential places and, and really um, meaningful places. And so that's been a lot of discussion in all of these mapping projects is you know, what can be freely and, and openly shared widely and what um, what the community group would want to only keep within the community and not share broadly. So I guess it's part of an ongoing discussion. We, it's never just the indigenous peoples and the academics together in a, in a room unless we go and attend one of their meetings or we're working on a, an agreement together. Whenever we're doing project planning, it's all the stakeholders that are involved and all the relevant governments. And so right from the beginning, we know, you know, it's the, it's the, uh, the three fishing sectors, the ENGOs, government at various levels, and we're all sitting around a table planning together. So I think right from the beginning, we know what's coming. And it's no surprise where the salmon go, you know, the, the terminal spawning ground. So a little bit unlike the mapping exercises, we know where the, salmon, where the salmon go. We know that they're genetically distinct stocks. Many of the questions that we're asking are about how many are there and how do we share them? And so there's, there's fewer secrets in that respect. So um, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of the, the real challenges come around allocation issues, and those are things that, that we don't play a role in deciding. We simply share the numbers, and then it's, it's, uh, the managers are tasked with that, uh, that horrid, horrid um, challenge of trying to figure out who gets what. And of course, when you're talking about, uh, about wildlife, conservation sort of comes, comes first, and everybody buys into that. Um, so, uh, so so we haven't come up against those issues where, uh, where there's any fears of data being used in, uh, in ways. Um, but I could see that certainly more on the human dimension side or some of the mapping issues where government does not know where 
uh, a certain organism goes or where they spend time. And I know in the north there's a lot of, uh, in Pengerton actually, um, work there on Greenland halibut, uh, trying to identify where the fishing line should be. This is work um, uh, Aaron Fisk's group out of the University of Windsor, uh, and trying to come up with management zones that have in the past just been arbitrarily drawn on on the map, and now the science is suggesting, well, actually the fish go here and do this and do that. So when you're generating new knowledge, new understanding, that's where there's potential for those things to um, um, to be a bit more complicated. Oh dear. Uh, could, uh, well, so let me say, I do I do have to to draw this to a close, but. <laughs> I love it, the fact that there are still questions yet to be asked because we will be moving into our lunchtime and then our, our group work this afternoon. I would like to uh, therefore invite you to continue with your conversations and with your questions of our panelists, and I'd like to thank our panelists very much. And of course, there was no intention that there would be an outcome from this discussion that we would come up with anticipating all the problems and finding all the solutions in an hour and a half. That is not, that is not the case. But what I think we have learned and will continue to realize is that like all of Earth and people, plants, we evolve. And research ethics is evolving. Methodologies are changing and evolving. Relationships between researchers and communities, whatever that community may be, to reinforce it's not a geographic one necessarily, um, that's evolving, but also too, when you put in your protocols to the Research Ethics Board, the Research Ethics Board is made up of colleagues, scholars around the table that represent, for the most part, the majority of the disciplinary projects that are going to come to them. And they have also the ability to bring in ad hoc reviewers when they review our, our, our scent and ethics protocol where there isn't that disciplinary knowledge around the table. So. These are not etched in stone to be the be all and end all. This is an evolution in research, in research ethics boards, in shared knowledge. So I thank you very much for being part of the discussion around that evolution. And you know, thank you and continue on with your conversations later. So an apprentice storyteller, and it was a position in, in the community, as a young man, would be allowed to tell a story until he got to one point where one inflection in the voice or one word was not right. Then one of the experienced storytellers, the elder storytellers, would gently stand by his side and complete the story for him. This was not embarrassing. There was no, no intention of humiliating the young person. It was just a matter for accuracy. The next time the young man had a chance to tell the story, he could see how far he could get. If he could get through the whole story, the story was then his, and he could tell it in the longhouse. But until he could get to the end of it, an elder would gently move him aside and complete the story for him. Because the accuracy over thousands of years must be precise. We are not written cultures, we are oral cultures. And I'll tell you another quick story, and I'll pray for the food. I worked for Parks, for Parks Canada and the, the Guayanas Archaeological Board. Sorry, I said that wrong. And uh, Daryl Fedgie was the, the main person in charge of the archaeology. We were doing field work. Sitting around the campfire one night with myself and Daryl and, and the rest of the Haida crew, I told him a story my uncle had told me. He said that we lived in the north. We're Nikun people. We're at the far north end of the island. We're the Rosefit people in Haida Gwaii. And one day the water started coming into the village. And they moved the village further. They picked up the, the car posts and the house posts. And they moved the whole village inland a little bit more. After a while, the water started coming in again. And so they moved the, the whole village, took it in hand, took it apart plank by plank. Uh, totem pole by totem pole and moved it inland a little bit more. This happened three times. Then finally the elder said, we're running out of, out of space. Uh, what are we going to do? They said, let's go to Skidigat. Chief Skidigat will probably take us in. So they marched on the inside, on the east side of the inside of the Hecate Strait Passage down to Skidigat, where Chief Skidigat gave said, yes, you can stay here, you're our relatives. 
and gave the Nikun people the north end of the island. We are still on the north end, the north end of the village. We are still on the north end of the village. Daryl asked me this. He said, John, how old is that story? I said, I don't know. I'll go ask my uncle. We had a break for two weeks. I went down to Victoria where my uncle lived. I asked him, uncle, that story you told me, how old was it? He says, I don't know. It's maybe 500 years old. So I went back and, and brought up that point to Daryl Fidge again. I said, Daryl, my uncle says the story is maybe 500 years old. Daryl said, think again. That story is 10,000 years old. Because you're, what you're describing is the rising of the ocean as the ice melted at the end of the last ice age. 10,000 year old story preserved word by word. And that's why our knowledge is so important to us, that it has to be handled accurately. And that's, that's why the knowledge which is private must be handled, must be kept private and sacred, must be kept to ourselves. There are things we share, there are things we don't. But our whole culture is built on the accuracy of those stories and the meanings of them.